Jim, thank you for talking to us. Uh, your store, Gays the Word, was set up in 1979 mm -hmm. by a group called Gay Icebreakers. What was the inspiration for the store? Um, there's a man called Ernest Howell who uh, set it up initially. He set it up, he had a mail order service uh, from 78 um, called Gays the Word. He had been in New York for a period of time and became friends with Craig Rodwell, who set up the Oscar Wilde Memorial. And when he came back to the UK, he was interested in maybe trying the same thing. So he set up a mail order service and used to go around to festivals and with himself and Peter Dory uh, providing initial backing. Um, and then he got other people involved trying to raise funds, Jonathan Cupville and Roger Baker, who was a member of CHE. Um, um, uh, Jonathan was a, an icebreaker uh, and they lived for premises and they found these premises in Marchmont Street. And initially, when they were um, looking for premises, it was difficult because uh, people worried, a gay bookshop? Uh, was this going to be a porn bookshop? Or what did it mean? In, in the old days, gay bookshop kind of meant a bookshop with magazines. Uh, and this was to be set up as a serious bookshop, uh, lots of politics, and half meeting space, and cafe, half bookshop. Because the back was a meeting space, wasn't it? And there was a piano at one point. There was a piano. Um, when they first, for ages, they had, you know, they had tables to serve food. It was only the first third of the shop was a bookshop. Uh, and by, within a year, they needed more space, so they got rid of the tables, and it started to move back with more shelving. Um, and where we're seated now, uh, when I came here back in 89 to work, uh, and indeed when I used to come into the bookshop in 84, this was the meeting space. There were built-in seats around, there was a table here, and there was notice boards all around the shop. With um, It's before the internet, and uh, so you would come here looking for flats, or information on benefits that were going on, or finding a lover. Uh, there were all these personal ads all the way around the show. Didn't Gaze the Word also pioneer mail order? Um, not... Gay News uh, had a fantastic book section mm. uh, in the magazine and they had a wonderful mail order service. Uh, we also uh, had a mail order service and had to have that. Uh, but it, we, we didn't pioneer it as such. Mm. I mean, um, Gay News was had an extraordinary... Looking at the pages of Gay News, they had, they had an extraordinary range of books in there. When you were set up in 1979, what sort of challenges did you face? Um, it was always underfunded. Uh, um, so you're doing uh, lots of things with lots of goodwill and no money. Um, there was, when we opened up initially, uh, we had shutters, big wooden shutters uh, on the front windows because of that fear that the shop would be vandalised. And indeed, graffiti used to be written up on the shop. Homophobic abuse, uh, homophobic abuse. Uh, kids stay out. Um, uh, yeah, and every day you would come in and take down the shutters and then put them away and then put them up at night. I know when we first decided to experiment in about the mid nineties with not taking the shutters out, uh, that fear of walking down the street that first morning, first few mornings, wondering had the window been broken and. It wasn't, and things had moved on, and I breathed a sigh of relief and just stopped the hassle of putting up shutters every night. Uh, we have had the window broken many times, but, um, you know, that tends to happen. Well, that just happens. Your store was one of the inspirations for the film Pride, mm. and it featured in Pride. How did you feel about the depiction of your store? Was it realistic? Um, yeah, they capture the energy of it. Uh, when the filmmakers came and looked at the shop, they couldn't use it because it's too long and thin for cast and crew and cameras. But they, a lot of the books came from our basement uh, from 1984. I had to make sure they were no later than that. And, um, and we gave them lots of information of what the shop looked like. Uh, when I went to see the set, I thought, oh, this is interesting because it was quite a square building, a uh, room that they were using, and then the Don't Worry it became elongated. Um, but it captured the energy of the people who used new ideas. We always had all different sorts of shelving and spinners here and books everywhere. And they captured, they captured that. Yeah. Yeah. How did it was a hive of activity. You had 
you know, the gay disabled group used to meet here, uh, gay socialists, icebreakers, which was um, a gay socialist group, uh, the lesbian discussion group used to meet here, and still does, that's 35 years old this year. Um, so it was a big non-commercial scene. Um, uh, this was before internet, so you couldn't buy books online. Shops didn't have gay sections. And this is uh, the very first newsletter we have, and it lists at the back uh, the places that you can buy lesbian, gay, feminist books in the country. And you've got, you know, Sister Right and Books Plus and Open Gaze Bookshop in Edinburgh. So you're actually, you know, telling your, uh, telling people where also they can, you know, access books. Um, yeah. You were the last surviving lesbian and gay bookshop in Great Britain, am I right in thinking? Well, there's never been many. Mm. So there was, there was us. Uh, there was also Lavender Menace in Scotland and Edinburgh, which became Western right. Wild which closed in the mid-90s. We were, we were a lesbian, gay, feminist bookshop when we started. Sister Right was there before us. They were in Upper Street, wonderful bookshop. They were a lesbian, feminist bookshop. And then Silver Moon uh, was a women's bookshop with a huge um, lesbian section downstairs. And there was Out in Brighton, lovely bookshop. And then there have been alternative bookshops with good queer sections. Uh, but there's never been yeah, that's, that's been it, really. Why do you think so many have closed? Oh, um, rents, people... The mainstream bookshops uh, looking for new markets in the 90s opened up gay sections, which is very good news for, you know, if you're a young teenager and you go into a Waterstone, say, in Reading and you see a queer section, you go, oh, you know, you're kind of validated. Um, the difficulty with that is, is the sections can get smaller or only become erotic fiction, or end up just under the stairs, hidden away. Um, so they haven't kept it up in a sense. So some of their chain, some of the shops in the chains have some very good sections, and some not. So you have the internet, and you have shops with gay sections. Um, yeah. How did you get involved with Gays the Word? Uh, well, I used to. I mean, I knew the shop from '84 when I first came out, and I came to icebreaker meetings and made friends here. Um, I was working with Minority Rights Group, which was a human rights charity, um, and a job came up, and I thought, oh, that looks interesting, uh, and I felt like a change, so I applied. What and year was that? 89, December 89. And, you know, you kind of think you're going to be there for two or three years, uh, but in fact, it's 25, because it's a wonderful space to be. There can be the stress of, of running the place. There's only two of us who work in the place now and then we use some casuals. Uh, Paul Hegarty, who was the manager when I was there, um, he joined in 83 and um, left the shop in 97. And I always think of trying to continue on Paul's legacy. Uh, he's a great bookseller, very political, uh, and to him it was very important that the shop both had politics and had an academic side. So you weren't just looking at bestsellers or erotic fiction or whatever else, although they're very important. It's about having a real range and breadth. And um, so I was, Paul, Paul died in 2000, uh, and I always just remember him and what he did for the shop and how he grew it, uh, and it continued on. One of the most infamous events here was in 1984. Mm. There was a raid by Customs and Excise. Right. What can you tell us about that? It's... Interesting. Um, I have these various newsletters at different points. This um, is from February, March '84 newsletter. You've got Alan Turing, The Enigma, has just been published, and Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin, the kids' book, which um, ra raised questions in the House of Commons. One of the first kids' books published by Gay Men's Press. And the footnote on Five Years On, if you can see. Um, Amanda, who was one of the managers at the time, says, In 84, gays the world will be moving premises. Our stock's expanding too quickly to hold us for much longer. We'll be staying in central London. This is February, March. In April, customs and excise raided the bookshop. Then everything changed. They took thousands of pounds worth of books. There had been other raids on other places like uh, Zipper and other shops that had more magazines and erotic fiction and some, and, and some fiction. Um, and they were just assuming it was more an erotic shop. Um, they took 
almost all the American imported stock. It wasn't about books that were published in the UK. It was we were raided under the Customs Consolidation Act of 1876. And the law was different from... From the Obscene Publications Act. Which was mainly for UK publishing for main, Yes, and there you can have a... You can argue your case on uh, literary merit, whereas Customs Consolidation Act you can't. Uh, it's at the whim of the uh, customs officials. So a huge campaign was started to um, keep the shop going. Um, Graham McCarro, who was one of the editors of Capital Gay, um, took... Um, leave from there and actually ran the campaign for us. And we're hugely grateful to Graham for all of his work in, in making sure that the shop survived. Uh, and he used all of his skills as a, a, as a journalist. Um, lots and lots of money was raised. Uh, questions asked in the House of Commons, people like Ken Livingstone coming to visit the bookshop. And it was seen as an attack on civil liberties, mm. which it was. Ken Livingstone was one of the bookshops, gave the words, early supporters, wasn't he? He was a councillor at Camden. Uh, initially, and when there was difficulty getting a lease, uh, and Ernest says some of it was from his name, people thought it was a joke that <laughs> the name Ernest Tell was asking for uh, a lease on a bookshop, on a gay bookshop, uh, and he supported um, the, the, the lease being granted, uh, yes, uh, and then later of course he became leader of the GLC, the Greater London Council, and later again he was Mayor of London. Since you've been running Gaze the Word, what are some of the biggest changes in terms of customers that you've noticed? Oh, interesting. What I like about working here is the range of customers from 16 to 90. Um, and people come from all over the world. Um, one of the things we have, you know, academics and journalists and people coming in to buy a magazine or just pick up the free papers. It's quite a community feel, you know, we do talk to people quite a lot. Um, Trans London meets here um, and today came about when a um, trans woman was asking about meeting spaces and I said, well, why don't you use the space here? It's free. Uh, and it's really grown as, as such. Um, and I think it's once a month and there can be 30 to 50 people come. Um, I remember in the old days when one was coming out, one would often get somebody coming in and say, oh, I've come out to my parents, they're having a breakdown, can you uh, suggest a book? And these days I'm often moved when you see parents come in and say, my 16-year-old son has just come out, have you got any books for him? Like appropriate fiction or books on coming out. And that shift uh, in acceptance. How has the material that you stopped changed? When we set up initially, uh, there was lots of debates about books that you would stock and not stock. Uh, in one of the those newsletters there, um, John Duncan, the manager at the time, talks about a, an ongoing debate with the gay Christian movement about our refusal to stock their literature. Because uh, in the early days, um, we didn't stock books on Christianity or therapy, because we felt that these were um, oppressive. And we've moved on a lot. So actually the shop is for people who happen to be LGBT and some of those religion is very important. So our religious section is quite big and we sell lots of it. We also have books on therapy. So we're slightly less pure and dogmatic, I think. My aim is to stock as many books as possible uh, for my customers. And I'm delighted to sell them anything, uh, actually. What do you enjoy most about working here? You can, I'm constantly uh, inspired by the people who come in uh, and inspired would be the wrong word actually. I can come into the bookshop in a bad mood, going, oh, you know, life coming down on you. And very quickly on the till, just that casual interaction with people who come in um, lifts my spirits. It's like extended family, and I love my family. Uh, there's so many nice people. And unlike, say, in other shops where you're service and you may be treated badly, <laughs> in bookshops for some reason people assume you have a brain and there is uh, yeah, genuine interaction. And you hear people's stories and you talk about books, and I love books, so it's always a pleasure to talk about books. And sometimes people come in, come out. I've had people shake my hand after they've talked. 
Uh, and it's important to me when a space, London can be both unfriendly and the scene can be threatening and unfriendly and uh, exclusive, uh, that here is an inclusive space uh, and that there's a warm welcome. Which doesn't mean that we have to chat to everyone when they come in. You know, people can come in, buy a book and leave. That's fine. But people do talk. Occasionally you get authors come in who do oh. book readings. Any favourites? Oh. I've not actually run the uh, Uli, my co-worker, who's fantastic. And um, uh, I've done huge amounts of work here. Runs the events now. Um, I can't think of favourites. It's generally a great pleasure to have authors here and, uh, and the place full to have a glass of wine. And it's just hopefully some of the people who come then come back when the place is quieter. But it really adds to the, the energy of the bookshop. Um, and they're, they're, they're lots of work, but they're great fun. They're great fun. Uh, as long as people come. It's always that worry, like having a party, will people turn up? Um, uh, but our job is, I suppose, to make the author feel as relaxed and comfortable when they arrive and then read about your book and this isn't a, a hostile audience wondering what are you saying here they're re they're ready to engage you it's mentioned special you mentioned earlier that many similar gay and lesbian bookstores have faced challenges such as higher rents mm -hmm. have you in recent years yes uh Cameron council who own the building um and we're treated like any other shop, any other business. So every year, every three years on our on our agreement, we have to face rent increases. Um, and they've become much more steep in the last few years, and it's very difficult. Um, back in about 2007, we did wonder when the new rent increases came up, whether we could afford to go any longer as a going concern. Um, and we were ready to close at that point. Um, Tim Tiemann, a journalist from the Times, came in and um, we were talking to him and we had talked about it at a board meeting. So he put word out um, on the Times, uh, published something about the Times, in the Times, um, and got together with Uli, my co-worker who ran the campaign, and we set up a campaign and put it out there about sponsoring shelves. And money started to flood in. And then the BBC picked it up, and The Guardian, and The Independent, and QX, and Gay Times. And Word went out from, you know, Australia and the US, and you're aware of all these people you've affected over the years. And it was really moving. Um, and, you know, shelves were, you know, £100, and most of the money that came in was from ordinary individuals. But it cleared debts and just gave us money in the bank and allowed us to continue paying the rent. <laughs> uh, and that was, it's been very nice in the last, what, eight years to have money in the bank, and which allows you to do more stuff. One more question. Yep. What does the future hold for Gaze the Word? That's interesting. We've just had a great year. We've just had a great year. Uh, and some of that is about the film Pride, where new people are discovering us for the first time. Because uh, people of my generation can often come in and they look and they, they read half the books, you know, but new generations and young people coming in for the first time and that excitement. Um, because sometimes you wonder with e-readers and how people access books, is there a reason for us to continue? That's in dark moments. Um, and as long as customers are coming through, and as long as there is engagement with individuals uh, on many different levels, there's a reason for being. Uh, the bookshop's got a lot of heart. Uh, it's never been just a bookshop. Uh, uh, sort of, and it's a safe, what I call, we have to, a safe space. Um, and a space which is non-judgmental and there for our community, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Where can we find you? Well done. Uh, we're at 66 Marchmont Street uh, in London. Um, nearest tube is Russell Square. It's a two-minute walk from Russell Square Tube. Jim McSweeney, thank you very much. You're very welcome.